This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The Denver Nuggets heading to the NBA Finals thanks to their sweep of the Los Angeles Lakers. And tonight we find out whether the Miami Heat can join them via a sweep of their own. It is game number four here between the Heat and the Celtics. We're going to preview that game and get you set for this week's Charles Schwab Challenge by talking to Brandon Gadula. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Join here as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. You can find his work over at NumberFire.com. Brandon the Nuggets into the NBA Finals via a sweep at the Lakers, but game four on tap for the Heat and the Celtics for tonight. How are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, a little disappointed with the state of the NBA Conference Finals. It's always fun to get some game six, game seven action in there, but I guess it's also equally interesting in a, in a different way uh, for these series to be just so one-sided. Um that being said, at least the Lakers were showing some signs of life. Uh, I don't really see it with the Celtics so much, so that's something we'll dig into here in a second. But, yeah, I'm kind of like in a strange mood where uh, the basketball's been still good, in a, but in a different way than like a back and forth who's going to take control of the series because two teams took control of the series right away and did not relinquish that. Yeah, you said, you know, you'd like to see a game six or a game seven. I'd settle for a game five, honestly, which we might not get across either of these series. So hopefully we can see what goes down for tonight. We'll break it down. Celtics Heaton, as mentioned, talk about some golf this week as well. In just a second, but first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, big week here for the show. Tomorrow, we're going to talk some NHL with Tom Vecchia. We'll also talk a recap of uh, Celtics versus Heat. On Thursday, we're talking Indy. 500 Monaco Grand Prix and Coke 600 with Dr. Nick Giffen of the Action Network getting his read on all those by talking to him and of course uh, baseball UFC everything all in the same feed as well get that by subscribing to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast or check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page if you like what you hear leave us a thumbs up on YouTube or leave us a five star rating over on Apple Podcasts the NBA playoffs are still going here for at least now we'll see but you can get on the action right now at FanDuel FanDuel Sportsbook right now. All customers get a no sweat same game parlay every weekend when you bet the NBA playoffs. That's right. Just place a three plus leg same game parlay or same game parlay plus on any NBA playoff game. You'll get bonus bets back if you don't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Head to the FanDuel app and get a no sweat same game parlay every weekend of the NBA playoffs. FanDuel official sports betting partner of the NBA must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG. Massachusetts Hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800 327 5050 for 24 7 support. In New York, 1 8778 Hope and Wire. Text Hope and Y. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. And in Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Now, we're going to talk about game four specifically for the Heat and the Celtics here in just one second. The Heat are one and a half point favorites in this game at the Andal Sportsbook. Brandon, I want to start things off by talking about the Heat here because they've exceeded expectations the entire playoffs, uh, covering a lot of spreads and winning games where they were big underdogs outright. Have you considered... Just making the playoffs to be their most relevant sample within your modeling system, or is that asking for a letdown and an overreaction to when they have beat the doors off of some very good teams? Well, let me first just say that uh, the Heat are 
like you said, playing extremely well and playing above expectation. And whenever like Bam Adebayo says in a post game press conference that, uh, or you know, an on court interview or whatever it was, or whoever it is, they're all saying basically the same thing. Where like, you know, people didn't really believe in the Heat um, to this point. Every like it feels like almost every every team every athlete has that mentality, but I think it actually applies for the Heat. Yeah. So these other teams and players like take note of what it actually means to be a little bit eight point underdog game one. You can call yourself an underdog. That's okay. That's very fair. Yeah. Um. I know some other teams in recent memory felt like they were completely slighted as uh they may as well have been. Destined for the number one pick based on how they they perceived it. I but, mean, three experts picked the Chargers to win the AFC West, so the Chiefs were were doubted. You know, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I mean, whatever whatever it takes. But I mean, yeah. it, it, in the same breath, like this is an actual sort of underdog story as far as professional sports go. But yeah, I mean, to, to answer your question, um, the the playoffs have basically just been without Tyler Hero. He played like 19, 20 minutes in that first game um of the playoffs before being out so uh you know the sample that i've basically been using for the heat is you know looking at their games with jimmy butler bam Adebayo, and kevin love and if you throw kevin love into the equation it's basically their games uh since like late february if you take tyler hero off the floor it's a lot of the playoffs um with some some of the regular season thrown in without hero on the court to, to make that sample bigger but as far as the, the postseason itself goes, they're up to um, oh, almost 1,400 possessions as a team, you know, in the postseason alone. And, you know, that's that's more than fine uh, for a sample if you want to go that route and look just at the postseason. But you'll see some, you know, I, I like a bigger sample. But, yeah. you know, it, the, the research that I've seen has said that around 500 possessions is when things start to stabilize a bit. We're well past that. Um, I like to go as, as long as I can while keeping it within reason and keeping it something that, that is, you know, relevant. That's why, you know, the relevant part here is, you don't want to look at the heat full season, right? May, may not want to look at their super hot shooting and just in the playoffs. So for me, I'm finding that middle ground with, with Kevin Love, um, also in the lineup and Kevin Love, you know, his, his health is noteworthy for this game because he came up, uh, slow in game three, but, They've been about two and a half points different without uh, Kevin Love. If I maintain the Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo are also active, you know, in that split. But you know, he's expected to play. He's probable uh, tonight, according to the injury report. So, you know, to sum all that up, I think you could probably get by with using just the playoffs for these teams at this point because they're so deep into the playoffs. So the possession count is higher for me. I'm not quite going that way because sure. their, their shooting has been you know, pretty substantial. Um, their net rating is about five points better just in the playoffs without hero and with love and, and Jimmy and bam, than it is if I factor in that the, the end of that regular season. So either way, they're a good team. Um, they're a lot better, obviously with just the playoff split, but um, I think I'll get into what that actually means uh, for the game itself here. Uh, you know, when we get to that. So let's talk about game number four for tonight between the Celtics and the Heat. Right now, the spread is one and a half in favor of the Heat here at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total 216.5. So the Heat going for the sweep here. When you look at those numbers you were discussing, do they view this spread as being pretty efficient? What's your read on game four between Celtics and Heat? Yeah, so if I use that sample that I mentioned with Kevin Love, Jimmy, and Bam, no Tyler Hero, including the regular season. The spread I have here is Heat by one and a half. Perfect. So <laughs> that's tough. Um, if I use just the playoffs, the play, you know, talking about playoff Jimmy, if I use just playoff Heat, that goes up to six and a half in favor of the Heat because a lot of that has to do with home court advantage as well uh, in the sure. playoffs. But I like to go at that larger sample, stay away from the spread. But if you think that, you know, the Heat are a, just a brand new team right now that Kevin Love's going to you know, be fine. Um, you'll play his usual ro uh, usual rotation, his usual minutes. Um, I wouldn't fault anyone for going with the Heat here. But the thing that I can't model for and the thing that's really you know hard with this game is the Celtics' interest. They, they look awful. Their body language is awful. Um, I just, like, they sat their starters at the end of game three. 
they're they just look like defeated. It just seems like Jimmy Butler and the Heat have just like reached into them and taken out whatever competitive <laughs> edge that they that they had to get them uh, there. And you know, I talked earlier in the postseason a little bit throughout the postseason is like. You know, I model a lot of sports, but basketball is the sport that I both model and have like the most experience playing. Yeah. And so, like, th- there's just not a whole lot from the Celtics that is really motivating me to want to bet in their favor. At least the Lakers hit, were like again were more competitive. Um, I had them with uh, 0.9 expected wins entering their game four for the Celtics. It's about 0.6, which is a pretty big gap. And the, and the Lakers actually had an expected win uh, percentage for me of like 55% for game four. Which I haven't really seen a whole lot uh, from the Celtics. Now, a lot of that has to do with their shooting, and that's leading into my favorite angle for this game is, is on the total. And it, so, you know, I can't back the Celtics, but I do, I do like the over. You know, we don't get a whole lot of game fours with the home team in position to sweep because that means the underdog is, you know, <laughs> doing some stuff. But it's really not that uncommon historically to see a lot of points in these types of situations. Um, the Heat kind of have a bad reputation uh, offensively, like long term. And again, I think that there's a lot of overreaction to Tyler Hero's impact on their offense. So I think that we're going to see the Heat try to put the pedal down and Frankly, the Celtics can't shoot much worse than they have been Uh, on wide open threes for the Celtics in the regular season. They were fourth in the NBA in three point percentage at 41.2% versus the Hawks. They were even better than that at 45.4%. That tumbled down uh, toward like the league average, even a little bit lower uh, against the Sixers, 36.8%. And we saw this offensive struggle start to start to trickle in. And now they're down to 32.6%. Again, this is on wide open threes. Uh, teams like to, to talk about defending the three-point arc. The way you defend a three-point arc is to limit three-point attempts. Mm-hmm. Just because the Heat, or sorry, just because the Celtics are shooting under 33% on wide open threes does not mean that the Heat are doing a good job uh, against the three-pointer on those shots. They, they're they not really controlling them. The Celtics are just bricking everything. Um, and again, like the, the league worst number on wide open threes for the regular season was 34.7% by the Rockets and the Celtics in this series are 32.6%. So there's only room to grow. Um, the heat are kind of flowing offensively. This is not necessarily like a grinded out, uh, you know, sort of series right now. The heat are willing to run. They're looking to run, get those, get those lobs up to BAM. Um, Jimmy's, you know, they're, they're, we're not just seeing everything come down to one second on the shot clock. And frankly, I don't see, uh, the heat just slowing it down. I think they want to, you know, make a statement here and keep pushing the ball. So I see a lot of points in this game relative to that two sixteen and a and a half over under. So I'm going with the over, uh, I think you could probably talk yourself into taking the heat, uh, money line, but you know, again, the Celtics have to be a bit better offensively here, and that's enough for me to, to just focus on the over. And your spread of one and a half accounts for expected regression or positive regression on the Celtics shooting perspective, correct? So like that's baked into the number on that on the spread perspective? Yeah, because what that's doing is taking the long-term approach of how good a team has been. It, and again, one of the fears of playoff stuff is – Certain teams shoot a bit hotter, a little bit colder. That kind of stuff does does throw a wrench into uh, the data. So yeah, because my the, the long term uh, numbers again, Celtics are a great three point shooting team. They're horrible right now. So you don't want right. to just look at you know points per game in this series, that kind of thing. You want to kind of have a longer term view that still makes sense. And if you can have that, similar to like why I'm using the regular season stuff with Kevin Love, it's more possessions, not just looking at when Caleb Martin looks like, you know, Michael Jordan out there making every shot he takes, uh, that's, you know, the long-term sample is going to be a little bit more indicative of what the heat should do. So yeah, uh, that, that regression is naturally baked in whenever you use a larger sample. Okay. So the spread appears pretty efficient here at one and a half uh, points. Brandon does like the over 216 and a half, which is minus 110 right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. We'll see if the Celtics can drag this series out a little bit longer, maybe even have some fun uh, and uh, make this series competitive. We'll see. 
on the golf side of things, let's talk about the Charles Schwab Challenge. They are a colonial country club before this week, a place we know plenty about because they've been here. I think it's like the longest running event at a single course, potentially. I might have made that up. Who can say? Anyway, it's one of them. It's up one there. of them. OK, uh, what are some keys to this course we should know before placing our bets for this week? Yeah, so it's a it's a it's got tight fairways, small greens and winning scores are usually just over like 10 under par. So like in the 12 under range is usually where we see a winner. It's about average length overall for a par 70 on the PGA tour. The the greens are bent grass. They're, they run a bit fast. They're like a 13 on the stint meter. Um, and as far as like field strength goes, we got three of the world's top 10, 10 of the top 25 in action. So not a bad field by any means, but it's not a designated event. It's not a major. And we see, kind of all types of winners at this event uh, because distance is not a must. So that means like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's like a bit top heavy again, not like a designated event sort of top heavy. And obviously we have a one, one singular um, heavy favorite, but you know, the past winners in the field are Sam Burns, Justin Rose, uh, Kevin Kisner, Jordan Speed, mm-hmm. Chris Kirk, Zach Johnson twice and Rory Sabatini way back in uh, 2007. But it's kind of a mixed bag of guys none of those are particularly long off the tee aside from like sam burns um who's got some length to him but you know it's it's a it's a bit more wide open and that does change the way that we view um everyone in the field including scotty scheffler who it feels like he's just going to run away with it but it's also not as simple as that in a week like this where it's a bit harder to run away with it whenever someone like kevin kisner can compete Right. And the question is, is that fully accounted for the odds? Let's take a look at the odds board right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Scotty Scheffler is a favorite. He is four to one to win this event right now. Jordan Spieth, who has a good history at this course and seemed to get better as the weekend went along this past week. He's 12 to one. Victor Hovind and Tony Fee now 14 to one. Let's talk about Scheffler first. You mentioned that a larger pool of golfers can realistically hang at this kind of course, but it's also Scotty Scheffler against a lot of not Scotty Schefflers. So, is there value for you in Scotty Scheffler at four to one? Um, not quite, you know, it's all. So one thing I want to just flag before uh, it, it goes overlooked is this is, is a smaller field. It's not a full 156 golfer field. It's like 120. There's been some withdrawals. I don't know. Um, you know, if that really makes much of a difference, cause they're going to round that out with, with some other names, but uh, I know Keith Mitchell is out. Taylor Montgomery, who I think the ship has sailed on Taylor Montgomery, unfortunately. Um, and Adam Svensson are kind of like the names that that are no longer in the field. Um, I mean, no Keith Mitchell, Scheffler should be like two to one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Keith, I mean, yeah. best, best driver of the golf ball of all time, basically, Keith Mitchell. Agreed. But so I have Scheffler around plus 550. Okay. Um, he was plus 490 at one point on Monday on FanDuel Sportsbook. He's now 4-1, to one, so I can't quite get there. But that being said, he's just so good right now, and that's the scary part. And, you, you know, we talk about it just because someone's a favorite or shorter than 10-1 to one does not mean they're a bad bet. I don't really see the value on Scheffler, but I will say this. He has been over the past 50 rounds – according to data golf with their field strength adjustments, he has been over a shot per round better than anyone else in the field. That's wild. Yep. Um, we know <laughs> his T to green game is point not, is it point nine? Basically point nine uh, shots per round better over the past 50 rounds than anyone else in the field. So if he gives us one of those performances and starts making putts, which it felt like he started to do a bit down the stretch uh, at the PGA championship, which is not indicative that he's turning things around his putting splits from five to 10 feet, which are, you know, if you had to pick one stat with putting to kind of really figure out where, where strokes gain are coming from, that's the one you'd want to look at. You can't really nitpick Scheffler Mm -hmm. um, from a course fit because he's played well here got the Texas angle, but I don't see the value on him. So I'm not quite getting there uh, with, with Scheffler. You said you have plus 560 on him. Plus 550. 
plus 550. So the implied odds there about uh, just about 15%. And his betting odds right now are 20%, which means you're pretty close to implied odds for him, which means I wouldn't be super wary about other people in the field in regards to, oh, I'm super underselling Scheffler, so it's hard to talk myself into someone else who I may be showing value on. I have some times where I think maybe I'm undervaluing the favorites and I'll be wary of other guys. But I think for Scheffler, you do have the odds allocated to him pretty high. So when you look at other outrights in this field, anybody else stand out to you as being good values this week? Um, so are you implying that I should be seeing value here? I mean, I'm, I'm saying that like I would not be skeptical if you did show value elsewhere because you are allocating a lot of win, win equity to Scheffler, even if you're not quite to where the betting markets have him. Gotcha. Well, unfortunately, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> there's not a lot. Uh, it's a lot of like justifiable bets. So Finau, Tony Finau at 14 to one. I have him at 15 to one. Colin Morikawa 16 to one. I have him 19 to one. Uh, Sung J M did shorten from 20 to 18. I have him at 20. So I liked him more. He's like the name is among the, the favorites that is still sort of in the best range, but I would also be all right with Max Homa. So like, it's a lot of, okay, the model itself does not show a lot of value. So do I just not bet anyone shorter than 50 to one? That's a question you got to have. And I think that's personal preference. Um, Because for me, the model, and you know, I could rerun these numbers and they'll be slightly different over 10,000 iterations. And maybe someone just has like a better performance in that in those, you know, those 10,000 iterations of this event. So, you know, it's close, but it's not really a week where I'm seeing a lot of value at the top of the board. If I had to pick one right now um, that I feel best with, it's Sung JM. Makes sense from a course fit standpoint. Very accurate off the tee. Not as good of an iron player as he has been in his career. He's, you know, uh, we thought whenever he came out, he was going to be like, Lights out. Call him Morikawa basically with yeah. his irons because he started off really hot, but he's fine. He's a good overall, you know, golfer, but he's probably the best name that I see in terms of value among golfers, shorter than uh, 55 to 1. And I can say that he is the best. It's basically he and Fino are like, they're close, but they're not values. So take, take, take that how you will. Right. Um, that's just kind of what I'm seeing in the data. There is a 20 still out there on Sung Jay. So if you can find that, maybe that's a better uh, bet potentially for you. Uh, but what about the 50 to ones or longer? Anybody, anyone you're actually willing to bet there? Or is it just spots where you're showing value, but don't actually want to take it? Because I, I have that plenty of times. Yeah. So it, it's not, you know, usually I see that on guys who are like 350 to one. It's like yeah. a shred of value. And it's like, well, I'm no thanks. not, I'm not yeah. going to. Like I'm not not gonna get there, but at fifty five to one we have Danny McCarthy. Mm. I have his odds at fifty to one. We know he's a great uh, he's got a great short game, accurate off the tee. Sort of gets you know hurt a lot at these events where distance is a bit of a must. Uh, McCarthy about four yards shorter on average than the average like world average golfer in terms of distance off the tee. Uh, according to data golf, but a great, great putter. So he's the kind of golfer who gets a benefit uh, from a course setup such as this one. Um, and then Brendan Todd as well, 90 to one, even more accurate uh, than McCarthy, better short game, but a, a worse ball striker. And then Andrew Putnam was 150. He is now 100 to one. His iron play has been pretty phenomenal. Over the past uh, three starts for him, his driver is usually what holds him back, but specifically with distance. He's losing almost 12 12 yards per drive to the field average, according to Data Golf, uh, but is gaining about seven percentage uh, points of, of fairways on his drive. So to put some easier context into that, he's 15th in accuracy and 112th in distance again, out of, you know, like 120 golfers in the field um, with really good iron play. He's got three top, top twenties at colonial in his past five years. I think he has five total starts and other two are missed cuts at this course. So putting them, I think deserves some attention uh, for this week. And, you know, I think this is probably just shaping up to be a week where I got to wait and see if anyone lengthens, lengthens at the top, that I can jump back on. But for now, 
kind of just having some uh, smaller unit allocations on um, McCarthy, Todd, and, and Putnam for now. Is there a preference for you between those three? Um, probably McCarthy. Okay. That's still a really good return, and he's just a better golfer than the others. I want you should like. I'm assigning you work. Um, I'm sure that you're thrilled about this, but you should like run a correlation to see like when Denny McCarthy does well, how is his performance tied to Brendan Todd? Because I feel like those two of all the golfers in the field would have like the highest correlation between like when they spike versus when they lag compared to the field. Those two like always are tied at the hip. It seems like. I think I think other places do that kind of stuff to try to do figure it. out. Yeah. Um. Those to, you know to answer those questions, but. It is a lot of work. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll get to it, but I mean, you have nothing else in your plate. So. I think we also know that it's true. Whenever <laughs> if it's a Brendan Todd week, it's a Denny McCarthy week, and it's uh, like an Andrew Putnam week. These guys with yeah. really good short games, but just short off the tee. So McCarthy, Brandon's favorite one there, fifty-five to one, but also some interest in Todd at ninety to one and Andrew Putnam, despite his shortening to a hundred to one. Any non-outrights you like this week? The menu pretty limited at FanDuel for this week. Uh, it looks like just round leaders up as of now. Yeah, just the first round leaders are up. I would, you know, usually, you know, it's not just a, okay, you like someone as a long shot, bet them top 10, top 20. I think the odds are good enough for for uh, McCarthy, Todd, and Putnam that I would mm -hmm. be interested in. Sure. At least top 20s, if not top 10s uh, for them. But two first round leaders do stand out to me. Uh, Russell Henley at 45 to one. He is the most accurate. Let me get this right. Most accurate golfer off the tee in the field over the past 50 rounds, according to Data Golf. And he's ninth in strokes gained tee to green. So it's obviously the putter that is the one thing that is lacking there. But, you know, first round leader, if the putter gets hot or if he just does, you know, hits almost every fairway, almost every green, that's a really good profile. And I do see slight value for him in my first round leader model um, for this week. And then JJ Spawn, 80 to 1, first round leader. He's 18th in the field over the past 50 rounds in strokes gained Tita Green, also 18th in accuracy. Another name that popped with some value as first round leaders go for the week in that specific model. Okay. So those numbers again, uh, JJ Spawn, 80 to 1, Russell Henley, 45 to 1 to be the first round leader for the Charles Schwab Challenge. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread, talking game four between the Celtics and the Heat and talking about the Charles Schwab Challenge. Brandon, thank you as always for your insights. I appreciate them as always. And we'll talk to you once again next week, probably previewing. Maybe not to, you know, maybe we'll all here. I'll like, I'll, I'll give the Celtics a disrespect. Maybe talking to heat nuggets, NBA finals next week and talking some golf too. Maybe. Yeah. It's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting game tonight. Going to be a pretty, pretty interesting golf event this week with a lot of names in play. Um, and, you know, going to be tied to a lot of long shots. So it's going to be one of them weeks. What could go wrong? All righty. Check out Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13 and find his work over at numberfire.com. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets for tonight in game four for Celtics Heat and for the Charles Schwab Challenge. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow for some NHL discussion. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 